exercise is interesting in terms of effects on the brain because it, it, it works in about four or five different ways. Uh, one of the most obvious ways is blood flow. And so if you uh, get your heart working, your brain's going to be filled with um, oxygen-rich blood and nutrients. So that's the main way that, that we thought it helps. The other way that's sort of interesting uh, is it's been thought that exercise produces uh, new neurons. And so exercise induces the production of growth factors, one, one's called BDNF and it actually stimulates the production of new brain cells. Now, when I was in school 20 years ago, we were told you can't get any new brain cells. So when you're born, that's your lot. You know, you're not gonna make any more. But more recently, we found that uh, exercise is a really good way of, of stimulating brain cell production. And some of these are functional. And so um, just this notion that something that you can do can generate new brain cells is, is a really great uh, uh, th th thing to think about. So we, we were wondering why exercise helps the brain. And what one theory is it just reduces stress. So maybe it's not that uh, your blood is coming to the brain, maybe you're less stressed and then, you know. And that, that was something that imaging allowed us to test. And so we scanned a whole lot of people with high cortisol levels. And so if you're stressed, if you're you're angry about something, or even if you're stuck in traffic, your cortisol levels can be very high. But one of the things we found is that the people with high uh, cortisol levels lost brain tissue faster. Well, that's a serious problem. So as soon as you know that's true, you can look at ways of reducing your cortisol. And so that's a very easy thing to do. I mean, we, we can get less stressed by um, exercising, walking, taking breaks. And so imaging established a physical connection between something in your blood, or the cortisol that's a sign of stress, and actual physical changes in the brain. That's very useful to know. Take care of your brain. And, and uh, there's a lot of ways we know that you can take care of your brain. You can eat a good diet, uh, you can exercise. You can reduce stress, um, you can make sure you're well educated. And these things just build up a sort of mental bank account for the future. And so e even though it seems like uh, you know, work is hard, I mean, you're building a store of brain connections that you'll need for the rest of your life. So these are practical messages that we've learned from imaging a lot of people. So. I'm going to London and you can do a scan to see your brain and yeah. Have you ever worked in the metalworking industry? Do you have any cochlear implants or other kind of ear implants? Yeah. Are you claustrophobic? Yeah. Do you wear a hearing aid? No. Do you have dentures? No. Any dental bridges or braces? No. Do you have any tattoos? No. Do you have any shrapnel from a wandering or explosion? No. Are you diabetic? No. Epileptic? No. Ever had a seizure? Is there any way you could be pregnant? <laughs> no. No? Okay. I went to my school a normal day and I went to my English class and um, I'm supposed to be, um, it's a, a play and I'm supposed to be reading aloud, but I just can't. Um, I don't know why. My one arm and leg is like pins and needles. And also I feel like I want to be sick. So I went to hospital and after that, I really can't remember, but I had a stroke. So the scan, what is it? It's a machine that uses magnetic waves and radio frequency magnetic fields to take a, a very high resolution photo of your brain. We kind of slice through your brain 176 times. So we take 176 different images and they're going from back to front, from top to bottom, and from left to right. Why is it so loud? The magnetic field, it's, it's measured in something called Tesla. And, and this machine in particular has three Tesla. It's much, much stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. And it is so loud because the bits that make the machine work, basically, they're being pulled by the magnetic field. So as we're scanning you, they're rattling because they're fighting against the force of the magnetic field. Your brain can be summarized in 176 different <laughs> slices. Now I have aphasia. My reading, my writing, my speech is affected. 
and now obviously I like to read and I can't read now so that's changed. Are you ready to look at your brain? Yes. yes. Um, so here we have um, three different pictures of your brain so we have a three-dimensional picture on the computer here. If we compare the left side of the brain here and the right side of the brain you can see this dark area is where the stroke has, has damaged the tissue. So writing and um, reading is the same um, side or is it um, different? Yes, so for reading many, many of the areas are the same as for your speaking but there will also be some areas that will affect your reading more than your speaking. The areas that you've got damaged here, I would expect to affect both your speaking and your reading, although your reading might recover a little faster than your speaking. There are many different pathways for language, and if you damage one, there'll be other pathways that allow you to make a recovery that will allow you to do the things that you, you, you could do before you had the stroke. Yeah. And I'm still at... Um like my um, my um, parents, I'm still at home now, so I think that's changed. So <laughs> really, everything. And we have a few patients um, and who've got similar damage, and I can show you. A, you know, you can compare. Here's somebody he's sl slightly more damage um, than than you have got. And what so, is? Because it's not speech and is it different um a different like function things? yeah these patients all have had difficulty speaking as you have in the early years but then patients after about four years to five years have started to come back into the normal range again mm -hmm. so in fact your stroke's one that we're really hoping will follow that course and that by five years your speech should should be back in the normal range i'm supposed to be at uni um, at um, biology so and I still like biology now um, so really I just want a job that's to do with biology just anything that I I don't know just anything that I like and um, yeah I want to introduce you to Paul Kale. Hey, Paul. Paul, hey, nice yeah. To meet you. Paul Kale is an ex army commando. He's fought in Afghanistan and Iraq. He also holds black belts in six martial arts. This could be interesting. With all the pain testing that I've done, I knew going in that they would not exert enough pain to seriously damage me. Correct. But with you, Correct. I I'm didn't know how you. I'm going to hurt you. <laughs> And, and the thing I is, I didn't sign up for this. Now, but the thing is, I'm not going to injure you. That's oh, the that's, secret. So the the good. the way that you develop your training mm. is pain without injury. Feeling real pain helps athletes develop mental tools to overcome it. I want those tools in life and on the climb. Now you're going to take this off me, okay? You can't go off the blue mat. You ready? Oh no! Can't no, go no, off no, the blue no, no, mat. No! Whoa! 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 whoa. <laughs> Oh, Jesus! Whoa! 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 Ow! 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 Whoa! The shock knife is a training tool to allow for combatants to feel pain associated with the techniques that they're doing. What was that? Okay, so it puts a huge amount of volts, but low amp, so no injury, just hurts. It feels like you've been cut. Wow, that really hurt. I was completely surprised. I didn't know that was coming. I felt like I had been stabbed, especially in the stomach. How many times did you cut me? I think it was a quite a few. I think uh, I could have stopped at maybe four, but I think I went to maybe six or seven. Oh, that's good. Because it just got funny in the end. <laughs> it was really funny for me. Because <laughs> literally, for me, I was in shock yeah, when you, you started giving me the... Yeah, yeah. We're not all getting into knife fights, but like Tor, Paul's convinced the key to people overcoming pain 
is understanding it. What you do is you put the pain into context. It's actually there to help you. So if I can understand the message and realize I'm not in danger, it reduces the pain straight away. And then I can carry on with the task. My task is taking the knife from Paul. I know it's going to hurt, but I need to treat that as part of the process. You'll feel pain, but it'll be put into context and then the pain will be numbed. It'll, it'll change, okay? If you get cut, you want it to be somewhere like along your forearm, things like that. Not so bad when you put it into context. Yeah. And yeah. if you are getting cut here, you need to associate that with positive pain. I'm cutting you where you want to be cut so you can access me and shut me down to stop any pain on the rest of your body. Does that make sense? That makes sense, okay. okay. Before I try, Paul is going to show me his disarming technique. Good times. So as I come in, Slowly. that touch that we yeah, spoke about, well. hit, okay. and from there, now I'm doing what you're doing. And as I lower this down, my head comes forward into here. So I end up hitting you across the neck area. My skull's going to hit here. I'm just going to hit you with my arm, okay. my heart. No, you're All right. Right. Oh, wow! And then I drop and turn. Okay. So I've hit you in the throat, I've yeah. headbutted you into the jaw and neck area. Got those, yeah. Okay, got that. Got that. <laughs> now got from that here, down. You've hit the ground. Yeah. Now just drive my knee into you. So okay. I come in here Good. and hit. Oh, Jesus. Right? <laughs> now I'm more balancing on your neck oh, no, so no. that I take the weight off you. I don't want you to be in too much oh. pain. <laughs> now, see this? Jeez. I'm actually using my... Uh, oh. All right. I'm using my shin. Yes, I feel that. On your arm. Yeah. And, oh, please. <laughs> and I can move the weapon, and then you're away. Oh. So does that answer your question about no, instate? That, that's clear. We don't need to go over that again. <laughs> I don't like that. Over the next hour, I learned a lot about pain. Paul's advice is feeling pain is fine, but don't be afraid of it, and don't let it stop you achieving an outcome. In fact, science has shown once we remove the fear of pain, it hurts less. And just grab like this. Try it yourself. You'll be amazed. Now, you know what you need to do, so you've got an objective. Mm -hmm. Instead of just rolling around screaming, your objective is to shut me down. If you back off, I'm going to slash you. I'm going to slash you back, and I'm just going to... The same thing is going to happen as before, but you are not going to back off. You're going to shut the weapon down, you're going to shut me down. You good? OK, let's go and close. Control it! Get on it! Get on it! Boom, there you go. It stops. Wow, that was amazing, because I felt that pain, but it actually felt good. Let's do that again. OK, done. Ready? Go. Yeah, good. Good, see? And that's the same voltage as you used on me last time. Exactly the same voltage. No change. Extreme. I don't know any other level. <laughs> when he first stabbed me with that knife, that was incredibly painful. But after the training, on the same voltage, I didn't even really feel it. I had an objective. Get to the throat, control the knife. And that's what I did. The pain was just a sideshow. Good. He's done very well. The way he's gone about the training, he's, he's listened to what he's been told. What's important is he's trusted in me that he can achieve this through this training. You're a good man. So are you. Thank Thanks you. Man. Pleasure to meet you.